So now that we've learned all about aromaticity, we're now going to learn about some of the reactions that aromatic rings can undergo. Now, you recall from the very first lecture, we talked about the fact that aromatic rings, because of their stability, don't undergo many of the reactions that we would expect other pi systems, specifically alkenes, to undergo. But they can be made to undergo uh, transformations, very important transformations, and one of the major classes that we're going to spend time talking about is a class of reactions known as electrophilic aromatic substitution. Now, the name can be just a tiny bit misleading because it sort of sounds like we're saying the aromatic ring is going to be electrophilic, um, it, and it's actually just the opposite. So the better term for this class of reactions might have been the substitution of aromatics with electrophiles. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't called that, uh, so we're, we're stuck with the name of electrophilic aromatic substitution, or EAS, as we'll say for short. But you might want to keep this alternative in mind uh, to help you remember uh, that in all of these reactions, the aromatic ring is going to serve as the nucleophile reacting with electrophiles. So just to put this uh, in, in very generic terms, all of the reactions we're going to talk about in this category follow this general format. So we have an aromatic ring reacting with an electrophile to give a substitution product where the electrophile has become bonded to the aromatic and then the leftover is, is the proton uh, that was substituted. Okay. Now there's a lot of details that we'll go into, but all of the reactions in this category follow this format. Okay. Um, just a few quick comments. The aromatic ring doesn't have to be benzene, right? It can be any of the aromatics we talked about, whether that's heteroaromatics, polycyclic aromatics, aromatic ions, or what have you. I also point out that I've noted the electrophile as being positively charged, <clears throat> and that can be the case, but it doesn't have to be the case. Uh, sometimes we'll find that uh, neutral electrophiles can, can be um, electrophilic enough. I've chosen to put the electrophile as, as um, positively charged here, just to sort of remind ourselves what an, an electrophile is, which is a very electron deficient species that wants more electrons. Okay, so I've uh, just chosen to, to list it as a positively charged species. <clears throat> now, before we go into the details of uh, this uh, type of reaction, I thought I would just give you one example where electrophilic aromatic substitution occurs in nature. And it actually turns out to be in a very important context um, which is in the production of the thyroid hormone, which is this specific molecule here. Um, it's otherwise known as triiodothyronine, or T3 for short. And uh, this is just a, a space filling model, so you can see, and it's got these uh, gigantic um, iodide substituents floating around there. So what happens, uh, so the, the, the thyroid hormone is absolutely crucial uh, for the proper functioning of your body. Um, and uh, I pulled this quote from Wikipedia, which I think gets the point across quite well. Um, so the thyroid hormone um, essentially uh, affects every uh, or almost every physiological process in your body. All right. So it, it's important for growth, development, metabolism, body temperature and heart rate. Um, and uh, I'm no medical doctor, but I think all of those things are quite important. All right. So this hormone is crucial. And the way that it's generated um, in the body is actually from tyrosine, the amino acid tyrosine. Now, actually, it isn't synthesized from free tyrosine. It's uh, these reactions happen on tyrosine that are part of a protein. But we can just uh, think about it in terms of, of tyrosine as if it was a free molecule. So what happens is the aromatic ring of tyrosine, remember this phenol that we talked about, um, gets functionalized by an enzyme called thyroid peroxidase. We're not going to talk about the mechanism, but essentially what this does is it, is it generates electrophilic iodine, and then EAS reactions happen at two different spots right next to that hydroxyl group to give you diiodotyrosine, again, in the con context of the protein. And then through um, a whole series of other processes, that diiodo tyrosine, sorry, it's a mouthful, gets converted into triiodothyronine. And in fact, there's actually a, a T4 molecule where there's another iodine on this as well. That's actually the, the pro-hormone. So anyway, 
is such an important molecule for the body, you would imagine that deficiencies um, in this uh, hormone are going to be uh, rather harmful. Um, and in fact, iodine deficiencies in the body can cause things like goiter and cretinism. Uh, iodine deficiencies are actually quite common throughout the world. Um, uh, upwards of, of 150 million people worldwide are uh, affected by iodine deficiencies. And so it's actually quite a big problem. Um, but it's also easily solved. So y you can uh, get proper iodine content um, from seafood, uh, where iodide is, is quite uh, abundant in the sea. And also uh, the way that it's been solved, at least in first world countries, is by adding iodide to table salt. So you might have seen in your... Um, on your container of salt at home uh, where it says on the side that this salt is iodized and that's the reason it's so that you're getting sufficient iodine in your diet uh, to make this thyroid hormone and again the way that the body does it is with this type of chemistry that we're going to learn about okay <clears throat> so what we want to do now is to uh, talk a little bit about um, electrophilic aromatic substitution um, and what we're going to do is to talk about this in, uh, in just in a generic way at first Okay, so we can talk about another type of electrophilic substitution to begin with. So let's remind ourselves about alkenes and how they re react with electrophiles. So if we have an alkene, you will recall that in the presence of an electrophile, that pi bond can be nucleophilic, react with the electrophile, and that's going to go to give us this type of intermediate, right? The electrophile has become bonded to one of the carbons and that leaves behind a carbocation. What can happen from here then is that some other species, a nucleophilic species can then trap that carbocation and then that is going to lead to this product, okay? where now we've substituted at both of those uh, carbons of the alkene. And so this is called an addition product, right? Because we've added two, uh, two species across the double bond. <clears throat> now, why does that work? Why does that happen? Okay, so let's remind ourselves about the nature of the pi bond, right? So I'm just gonna draw a little bit of a perspective drawing here of an alkene. And remember, so we've got the, the carbon, the two carbons, sp2 hybridized, bonded to each other. And then we've got this, this pi electron cloud above and below uh, the plane defined by those sp2 carbons, right? So above and below. And so the nature of the electrons in um, a pi bond or a p orbital, um, either of those, uh, is, is such that there's actually zero electron density at the nuclei um, and so the, the electron density is actually uh, relatively far removed from the nuclei, right? So it's just the opposite of when you have a sigma bond where those sigma bonds are centered around the nuclei, they're held relatively close and therefore they're not uh, as readily given up. In a pi bond, they're, they're held far away from the nuclei, relatively speaking, and so they're not as close, right? So they're, they're actually able to be nucleophilic. So that fact, coupled with the fact that carbon is not as electronegative as, say, oxygen, nitrogen, or the halogens, right? So if we have a pi bond centered on carbon, it's uh, going to be relatively nucleophilic um, unless there's some special circumstances, and we can talk about those later. But your normal alkene pi bond, the pi cloud is nucleophilic, okay? All right, so now let's compare what happens in a similar situation if we have benzene, okay? So we're gonna have benzene, and I will just draw in a benzene here. Now, in this case, if benzene is uh, in the proximity of an electrophile, and remember it has to be a reactive enough electrophile, but let's say that it is, um, in fact, the same first thing will happen, that the pi cloud of benzene can be nucleophilic and it can react with that electrophile. So if we allow that to happen, this will lead to an intermediate where now the benzene ring has become bonded to the electrophile and that 
of course, has to leave behind a carbocation, and this will be at, at an adjacent position, um, at least in, in the first resonance form that we'll draw. Okay, so we get to this type of intermediate. Now, this is actually um, a rather stable carbocation, if you think about it. So we just talked in, in lecture, and uh, you, you may recall from last semester, that the allylic carbocation is, is a very stable uh, situation, right? So you can see that, that here is our cation, and it's allylic to, to that double bond there. But actually, in fact, it's, it's allylic to a diene, right? So that's even more stable. Allylic cation is stable, but if it's allylic and part of, of um, a, a dienal system, right, that's five total uh, carbons in that um, extended uh, pi system, right, that's going to even be more stable than an allylic. So this is looking pretty good in terms of stability. The, the problem, right, <clears throat> is not that this is so unstable, it's that we had to break aromaticity to get there, right? So that's the problem. That's why we need such a strong electrophile. But once you get here, this isn't so bad. But now, in contrast to an alkene, um, this, uh, this uh, intermediate is not going to wait around for a nucleophile to add to it, right? Because it, it's very sad that it lost its aromaticity, right? So it, in terms of where it started, it's very high uphill in energy. So rather than having a nucleophile trap this carbocation, what's going to happen is we're actually just going to deprotonate. We're going to get that pair of electrons back and regain our aromaticity. So what's going to happen is that there's going to be some base and um, the, the base might change based on it, what exactly what reagents we have in there, but uh, it doesn't matter that much. This is a, an extremely simple, easy deprotonation to do. Okay, so it doesn't take much of a base at all to make this happen. Um, and so the base of deprotonates, that proton, which is on the same carbon that the electrophile became bonded to, right? That's the available proton. And then that pair of electrons gets to reform aromaticity. Okay, so we've reformed that uh, linkage. And now you can see we've re returned our benzene ring, so we've gained back all of that aromatic stability. And then we will, of course, be left over with our protonated base, which in this case is going to be positively charged. Okay, so um, that's, that's basically the format. Okay, so why does that happen? We've been talking about aromatics as being uh, different than alkenes, but, you know, it, at least in a certain sense, they're, they're not so different. All right, so let me draw a little perspective of a benzene ring. And as we've learned from the previous videos, there is this pi cloud in benzene. And uh, in, in some ways that pi cloud really isn't any different than any other pi cloud, except that it happens to be circular, okay? So it's cyclic conjugation, and we know that this has a, a special stability associated with it but it is still a pi cloud, right? So it has a node where the nuclei are, right? So all that electron density is going to be held above and below the plane of the nuclei, okay? So relatively far away. And therefore, uh, and it's still made up of carbons. Um, in other aromatics, there might be heteroatoms, but in general, we've got a pi density that's relatively um, willing to be given up, okay? Now, Again, you have to temper that with the fact that in order to be given up, you have to break this, um, this resonance stability of aromaticity. But nevertheless, it's still going to act, um, in this case, in a, a nucleophilic manner, right? So the aromatic is the nucleophile reacting with an electrophile, okay? So those are the two differences. The difference is that you, you have to break aromaticity, so you're going to require a much stronger electrophile and once you get to the intermediate, instead of doing an addition product, you eliminate to generate a substitution product. Okay? So here's the thing that you can remember. Every single reaction that we're going to talk about follows, in terms of electrophilic aromatic substitution, that is, follows this general mechanism. Okay? They all follow the same mechanism. Now, some of the details might change, and, and 
the major detail that changes is that the electrophile is different and there are some mechanistic details that uh, um, are used to generate these reactive enough electrophiles. But in terms of the actual chemistry that's happening on the aromatic ring, it all follows this add and eliminate the proton. It follows that scheme, okay? So it might be worth you spending just a little bit of time um, committing this general mechanism to memory because you're going to be able to apply that in all of the other EAS mechanisms, mechanisms that we're going to talk about. Okay, so in the next video, we will start in and talk about a uh, specific um, uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution uh, set of reactions um, where we're going to add halogens to the aromatic ring.